Okay, we're just going to give a few more minutes for people to um, log in and join. Um, so I'm going to give it about a minute or two, and then we'll get started with the presentation. Alrighty, I see people joining. So I'm gonna give it another minute or two just to let allow the other um, participants to join. Alrighty, so it looks like some um, participants are already in. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start with just the introduction and that way it'll allow people to um, still log in um, until our presenter is uh, ready to present. So good morning and, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning for the CAS Certified ADA Compliance Information Webinar. I'm Suhei Mojiga, I am the Senior Coordinator of Business and Assets of the San Pablo EDC, and presenting with me today will be Basam Atwal. Um, let's see here. So just before we get started, um, this webinar is being recorded. A recording will be available on our website at www.sanpabloedc.org. Any resources mentioned during the presentation will also be available. You can reach out to us directly email us or call us and we can make those resources available to you or put you in contact if um, that is what you're looking, um, you know, in information in regards to, but we'll also have information on our website. Um, all participants are muted, so we do welcome your questions. Uh, what I will ask is that you type them in the Q&A box or in the chat box. You can definitely raise your hand and type it um, in. And then if we have time during the webinar, our presenter uh, will either um, answer your questions during, or we might have to wait until the end, but your questions will be answered if we have um, time, if time allows at the end of um, the presentation. Uh, let's see here. And just before we, I uh, introduce our presenter today, just to give you a brief overview of what San Pablo Economic Development Corporation uh, does in terms of programs and services that we provide to the community and to the Contra Costa County uh, area. Uh, we have technical assistance for businesses, membership and sponsorship benefits, access to capital, home ownership, job development and career counseling, degrees and certified training, and employment support, support services, just to name a few. That's just a quick summary. But again, you guys are welcome to reach out to us if there's anything that you would like uh, more information on. And to get started today, our presenter again is Bassam. He has a master's degree in architecture from the University of Venice, Italy. He's an architectural designer, project manager, and a certified access specialist. Bassam has over 30 plus years of architectural experience, including 20 plus years of experience in the United States. Um, this webinar, again, was possible with the help of our wonderful partner, Cal Accessibility and Bazam. We are grateful for their partnership and collaboration with San Pablo EDC. And again, um, I would like for everyone to welcome Bassam. Bassam is all yours. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So give me one second. Um,
Um, just please um, confirm to me if uh, if you could see the screen and you could hear me. Yes, we can hear you and we can see you and every yeah, the presentation slides are perfect. All right, uh, very good. So uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for the EDC for doing this. Actually, we have done uh, multiple of these throughout the years, trying to help people literally to avoid uh, uh, lawsuits. Uh, unfortunately, these days, these lawsuits are equivalent to the pandemic. And through the use of our experience, we noticed that wherever there is uh, economical hardship, this lawsuit goes out, goes up in number. Just to mention one particular guy without mentioning his name, he's very new to this, like just the last year, and he's already around 4,000 lawsuits. So these are um, literally predators uh, taking advantage of uh, the law. Anyhow, uh, start the presentation. Uh, my name is Bassam Alkwal. I'm a certified access specialist. Um, I uh, do what is called CASP, C-A-S-P, Certified Access Specialist uh, Program. Um, but I wanna start mentioning this quote from Orlando Batista. I really like it. It says, an error doesn't become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. This is exactly what's happening in, in the ADA community. Um, these lawsuits, are not ADA lawsuits. These lawsuits are discrimination lawsuits and they use the ADA as uh, the proof of discrimination, which they literally say that a person is refusing to correct a barrier, which is the, mis the error in his property and thus it becomes a mistake and thus they become sued. So, um, I wanna start with a few concepts. Um, these concepts are, just remember the year 1992. This is when the ADA law um, got implemented and, um, and it's the trigger year. Um, what's before the year 1992, uh, people like to think it's grandfather rule in, there is no such thing. Grandfather rule in is when you, somebody obtains a permit, but it does not apply to federal ADA lawsuits. Uh, what's the difference is if the establishment last permit, not just construction, the last permit obtained is before 1992, what applies to you is something called readily achievable. And uh, readily achievable means, and I will, I will, I will talk about it in a second, but it means that uh, you try to do it uh, within your means uh, and and uh, the, the, the easiest uh, possibility to do it might not meet the code 100%, but you bring it to the best of your ability. After 1992, there is something called safe harbor. And safe harbor means that if you built it in a year after 1992 and you are compliant with the codes of that time, you don't have to change anything. That is a, a very tricky thing, but it is, it is, it is uh, a defense. Um, and the third thing I wanna, I wanna uh, mention to you, the difference between the code and the law. The code is, is the technical information that applies to any barrier and I'm going to be using the word barrier a lot. Uh, the word barrier, uh, it's it's uh, it's like if your parking is not configured right, that's a barrier. If your door pressure is too high, that's a barrier. So the word barrier applies to any technical ADA item that is uh, that is in the code. Uh, so code is the construction code. There is uh, multiple codes. Uh, throughout the years, there's federal codes, there's California codes, there's housing codes. There are there are almost infinite entity of codes. Uh, uh, but if you do any construction, if you modify, you use the code. The law is the law. It's similar to any other law that is punishable. Um, federally, it's punishable by just making you fix it. California and Hawaii 
is punishable also by uh, making you pay a fine. And we could talk more about that and answer more questions about that if, if, if uh, needed. Um, so according to the DOJ, the Department of Justice, and I'm going to read this exactly. If you own, operate, lease, or lease to a business that serves the public, then you have obligations for compliance. In uh, layman language, that means landlords and tenants are both responsible. And regardless if the landlord has in his lease uh, an indemnification to point this into the tenant, that is between them. That is a legal thing between them. And uh, uh, But uh, legally, uh, landlord did not get away with that in, in court. So the readily achievable we talked about earlier, it says without taking an excessive expense. Now, uh, this is a tricky one because people, I, I met a lot of, they say, hey, I can't afford to do this. Uh, I don't know their finances. I, I, I take their statements on, the, uh, on its face value. However, if you go to court and we use the financial hardship, and this is, this is the language from, from, uh, from the law, financial hardship means that I cannot use it. The Department of Justice requires that the mother company or the highest owner be responsible and it trickle down from there. And the financial hardship, if you use it, the opposing parties can, and they have the right to go for a financial forensic investigation of your assets, not just your corporation, anybody who's related to this project. We have never used this, um, uh, this financial aspect as a defense. It backfires all the time. So before you say, I can't afford to spend a thousand or two thousand, um, think twice what this what that could uh, come back and hurt you because if they do a financial investigation and they found out your ability to pay for something you just prove to them your intent to discriminate against people with disabilities by not providing the service by pretending that you cannot do it and that is exactly the essence of these lawsuits uh, so a barrier, a barrier is, is uh, any element that does not meet the standards, the ADA standards, American Disability Act standards, or California Chapter 11A or Chapter 11B. Uh, we talked about uh, 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 literally achievable, and we talked about the safe harbor. I sometimes call it safe haven. Um, so... Um, uh, if there's any questions, I, I'm, I'm willing to answer about that at the end if needed. But let me explain to you what's in the ADA, the American with Disability Act. It was passed uh, actually during um, uh, George Bush time, and it's to prohibit exclusion of anybody. So everybody are equal under the law. The ADA has uh, five sections. What we care about right now is Title Three. Which is, uh, which is related to public accommodation. Any place that is uh, open to the public, allows public in, meetings, uh, purchasing, um, any public that goes in, they are open to the ADA. Um, Title IV, uh, uh, it's telecommunication, and this is, some, this is the future. Uh, we just started seeing a lot of lawsuits related to websites and uh, people not being able to access websites. Um, but here we are, we are totally con concentrated on Title III. Um, here's some, some good news. This, this has been around since 1992. And if you have a pen handy, uh, please write it down. Uh, tax credit, Section 44 of tax code, gives you up to $5,000 each year. It actually gives $10,250. $250 is for uh, um, uh, fees and 10,000, and you are allowed to use 50% of that. So you have $5,000 credit every year for any ADA work that you do. 
Like if you're a restaurant and you buy tables, 88 tables, you take that money down. If you paid $100 for the tables, you take $50 back from Uncle Sam. How does this thing work? At the end of the year, when you pay your taxes, you will uh, you submit receipts instead of paying taxes. So if you have receipts for $10,000 and you owe taxes for $5,000, you give them those receipts and you don't pay nothing. So that reduces, uh, and that, apply, that applies also to the landlord and the tenants. There is a very, um, uh, almost everybody uh, uh, comply with this. Uh, there's a couple of, of uh, exclusions, like if you make millions, uh, over a million dollar, uh, or if you have more than 25 employees. But if you do, there is uh, a tax deduction, section 190 of the tax code. It gives $15,000 deductions for any ADA work that you do. And that applies to everybody, regardless of number of employees and regardless of um, uh, uh, the amount of money they do in, in profits. So if you take anything out of this presentation, take, write down 44 and take advantage of it. This was available since 1992. That made it, um, made it interesting for the plaintiff lawyers to use it actually saying that, hey, you had money from the government since 1992. How come you did not fix your property? And ignorance was never uh, uh, an answer. I did not know about it. Does not is not is not a defensible answer. Um, so, California noticed uh, that these lawsuits have been abusive. So um, they they came with uh, Senate Bill sixteen oh eight. The one thing that Senate Bill sixteen oh eight uh, around twelve years ago it's created the cash program, but it did something else. We have a law in California called the UNRWA Act. The UNRWA Act says if you discriminate against anybody for race, religion, uh, sex, any kind of discrimination, including disability, you have to pay a fine of $5,000 per barrier, which means a bathroom has 68 barriers. The lawsuits 10 and 15 years ago used to be 200 and 300,000 lawsuits against a business. It definitely will take the small businesses out. So California came back and said, no, 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 no. We will do it per visit. So they reduced the $300,000 damages to $4,000 damages. That's a great reduction. But at the same time, those who used to sue, they knew that they didn't sue uh, uh, small businesses because $300,000 would take them out of business. They usually were limited to around 50 and 60, where people have to think about it. But now it opened up to, uh, to uh, multiple lawsuits against small businesses. And I will talk about uh, the average of, of the lawsuit settlement. And if I don't, please remind me. Uh, but this was not enough. This was not enough because uh, California realized that the amount of lawsuits did not stop. So they introduced a second bill, 1186. It's, uh, it tried to eliminate those, those lawsuits and reduce attorney's fees and make the attorneys pay uh, higher, higher fees. This, uh, this bill uh, created, uh, uh, it amended actually this, the civil code and, and, and uh, created uh, the limitation of amount of money for small businesses to pay, even if they don't have and hire a certified access specialist. Um, but again, it was not enough as well. So California came back with Senate Bill 269. Senate Bill 269 allows a small business 120 days of uh, grace period. It will stop the damages from a lawsuit. So if somebody sues you 
120 days after you do a CASP report. You have to obtain a CASP report to, um, to take advantage of Civil Code 55.53 and 55.56, which is Senate Bill 269. And and uh, um, and limit the penalties against you, and that is when you obtain a CASP certificate, you will get a notice of access inspection, similar to the one in the picture, and that you have to post on your front door, and that acts like uh, a deterrent. Um, they would know if they sued you. This does not cover the already filed lawsuit. It covers future lawsuits, but it does help because we noticed a lot of uh, of lawyers following other lawyers and filing lawsuits. Um, below in, in your screen, you see uh, part of a sample of from a CASP inspection. It was, for example, a, a, a cashier counter. Top of the counter is not 28 to 34. We found that the top of the counter was 38 inches. And depends on the year of construction, we could suggest solutions. So that is, and there will be pictures. That's part of the CASP inspection. Um, but at the same time, you will get another certificate, maybe other two certificates similar to the one. And this certificate here, if you see my mouse, let me see, if you see my mouse, there is a number in here. And this number is related to your address. And this number, this certificate is, uh, um, um, it's for you to decide to post it or not. I always suggest for my clients to post it because it's like the alarm sticker on a car. And the alarm sticker on a car uh, tells you this car has an alarm, go rob another car or go break into another car. And, uh, and uh, this certificate on the back of it, it will say, what's your status? Your status will be inspected by a CASP, which means that you still have barriers you need to fix, or compliant. They both look alike. Uh, what I suggest is if you get this certificate, make a color photocopy of it, of the front of it, and post that, uh, that color photocopy in your window and keep the original in your files because the sun will destroy it. And uh, and again, you don't have to share the information on the back of the certificate with anybody. So um, uh, I'm gonna go start giving you some examples of barriers with pictures and we could talk about that. Um, but this is a good time if there's any questions related to the taxes or to the laws that we have talked about. I don't see any questions in the Q&A box. As, as, if I see any, I, I will um, let you know. Okay, yeah. alrighty. Mm -hmm. um, so let's start with a very, very common uh, thing related to if you have parking. There's a lot of people who bring in the sign from their towing company and put it on a post and they think they're compliant. They're not. This is the compliance sign. And there's rules and regulation about the size and the language. However, almost everywhere I see people posting this sign without the phone number information in it. This sign is not valid unless it has the phone number information. So the phone number should go in here. Uh, it's very important. Just because you have this sign and under it, there's another sign with the phone number of the towing company, that does not help. Um, uh, this sign is specifically not related to people with disabilities. It's related to, to people who are able to know not to park in a people of disabilities. This is a very, very common mistake. And most of my examples here, I'm going to show you are common mistakes. Um, example number two, there are a lot of 45 degree parking. When a parking is designed at 45 degree, the way it's measured, you could see it in this lower, uh, lower picture. This is how we measure 45 degrees. It's almost always measured wrong, almost always. And that is something that contractors 
don't catch, still haven't been catch, and uh, and it is a problem. So a parking should be nine feet wide, 18 feet deep, with a van accessible of eight feet wide or uh, five feet if it's not van accessible. But if it's van accessible, the access aisle, this is called access aisle, has to be to the right of the parking. So if you have only one parking, it has to be to the right. This is a very common mistake because most small shopping plazas have their parking at, at, uh, at uh, 45 degrees or 30 degrees. And it's typically, if you only turn the ADA parking uh, to 90 degrees, you will have the same exact space. Not in the same, not in where the picture that I showed you, because in this picture there is also uh, uh, the curb there. But in general, uh, the 45 degrees, you could obtain it with the 90 degrees, maybe one foot, but one foot difference. The other common mistake, and this is related to California only, is the parking signage. In California, we have to have put the minimum fine on the parking thing. We have to. It is. It is. Uh, uh, it's not federal, it's related to California. So on a federal lawsuit, this might not fly, but I saw judges who said uh, California uh, is more stringent and we have to apply what is more stringent. Um, the van accessible sign uh, has to be on the left sign, left parking with the access aisle on the right. And this is another common mistake. The other common mistake that if the sign is in a path of trouble where people walk under the sign, the bottom of the sign has to be 80 inches. Uh, it's, it's very important so people don't get hurt. Um, moving on, ramps. Now, what we have here is what is called a curb ramp. A curb ramp differs from a ramp. The difference between a ramp and the curb ramp is that the curb ramp is a connection between a vehicle way and the path of travel, which is a sidewalk. A ramp is a connection between a path of travel and the path of travel. So vehicle to a path of travel, curb ramp, uh, uh, a walking space to a walking space ramp. If you have a curb ramp, you don't have to have uh, a railing. But if you have a ramp, you have to have railing. And there's special designs for the railing. This is an older design. Right now, the new railing, the measurement 12 inches has to be to the inside of the of, of the curvature. And again, safe harbor or readily achievable applies in, in this case. The other common mistake of a ramp is at the end of the ramp, it has to be 72 inches long, the landing, not 60 inches. So people, uh, so the extension of the railing is applicable without interfering with the turning space. That is another uh, very common mistake. Um, let's talk about other common mistakes. Door handles. You need to always think about people being able to open the door with a closed fist, without pinching or twisting, without pinching of the fingers or twisting with, of the wrist. And typically, a lever can door handle will fix that. Um, the other common mistake is the slope in front of a door. It can't be over 2%. 2% is almost flat. It's quarter of an inch per foot. And, and uh, in existing buildings, that is, if you cannot change the landing, that is easily accomplished with, um, uh, uh, with an automatic door opener. Again, remember tax code 44 helps you pay for these things. Now, if you, if you literally, oh, the other example here is regarding signage, uh, proper signage, um, depends on one kind. It does not apply to retail, but it does apply to offices. 
if your if your office is number three, you have to have a sign on the latch side of the door with California grade two braille telling a blind person that this is office number three. Um, so uh, moving on, staying on the same subject though, what happens, this is a, an exact sam sample of a lawsuit I had in, in 2010, uh, 11 years ago, wow. We couldn't bring down the door landing. There's not enough space next to the door to open the door. So what to do here? Because there was a beam in here, we couldn't bring it down. So what we did is actually install a sign and a buzzer, offering assistance by installing, not installing or bringing out a portable ramp. They are cheap, they are easy, and uh, they're foldable. And once somebody rings the buzzer, the the uh, attendant inside goes out, put the portable ramp with a couple of cones, and uh, and uh, and allow access. This way, a person with disabilities has the potential of, of, of accessing. Now, if all fails and we cannot put a portable RAM, we could still have a sign and a buzzer and offer what is called a curbside um, assistance. Now, this is literally applies to anything before 1992. It will not apply to any building after 1992 because any building after 1992 had in its codes not to do, sorry, not to do this. So um, that's where the codes come, come, come to play. Um, other very, very common mistake is, um, is not having wheel stops next to a path of trouble where a car, those are smaller cars, but a bigger car could come and if a car parked in here with backing up a truck, it will cover half of the access aisle and the person with disabilities can't pass. It is 48 inches, the passing. So uh, federally is 36, California is 48. California more stringent, we go with California. So this is very important to notice if the path of travel is adjacent to a parking, you have to have wheel stops to stop the cars from overlapping on top of the path of travel. Other common mistakes, again, it depends on the year of construction, is these kinds of access aisles. This is other than not being acceptable, it's actually dangerous because this side flare, if a wheelchair goes in it, they're gonna flip sideways. So these are, be very careful if you have these in your, in your property. Uh, the proper design is to drop the sidewalk and have a curb going right and the curb going left. Uh, in this in this particular case. Now, um, when I talk to you a little bit about about doors, there are in this picture there's multiple of multiple elements that are not compliant. But a door, if you're approaching it from the pull side, has to have a clear space next to it by 24 if it's exterior, 18 if it's interior door, because. Uh, so a person with a wheelchair C has to go sideways to open the door. Now, uh, uh, this is very important, but also has to have 60 inches, so they will be stand safely. So we measure the landing in front of the door to make sure that people could go in. Um, other things that related to a door, for example, if the threshold is too high, now, it depends on the year of construction. We could always install what is called a threshold transfer. But at the same time, if your door doesn't open 32 degrees, see here between the fully open door and the edge of the door, 32 inches is, is uh, at 90% uh, at 90 degrees open, must be the clear space to pass. In older buildings, sometimes it's too expensive to change the door. We could always install an offset a uh, hinge that brings the door to the inside. This is like $70 worth of solution, but this, this gives you, adds two inches. So if your door at 30 inches with the offset hinge, you will get to the 32 inches. It's an easy solution. 
the the transfer are easy solutions as well. Um, but those are very common. And actually, uh, if you look at this picture, this door also does not have 10 inches clear space at the bottom. And that is important for a person in the wheelchair to be able to push the door with his wheelchair. Um, I just recently had a case, it's, it's much more complicated, where the threshold was this high and a person was pushing his 80-year-old mom and hit the threshold and she fell down. Uh, had an operation, two months later she died. And now we are in a huge lawsuit that is, it's, it's ADA related, but it is, it is a big liability. The good news is insurance will pick up that lawsuit while most insurances do not pick up the ADA lawsuits. The other common item, which is, it's totally, um, Totally, uh, uh, it's around 80% of the current lawsuits regarding restaurants is a table. So a table must have 19 inches depth for people for their, for their wheelchair. They must have nine inches high for their toes. So this is a very important thing that if a table has a center post, it's not going to work. Never we saw a table with center poles unless it's a big circular table that have more than 19 inches depth. Still, the table has to have 27 inch clearance under and maximum 34 inch high. So if you look at the picture on the right, this is this is the right table as well. And and so this up is what we call um, a T-shaped post. This is the easy solution, and I'll show you in the next slide how 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 are these done. But once you do your tables, this is very important in restaurants, the path of travel between tables is 36 inches. But it's not measured from edge to edge. It's measured when the seat is 19 inches away, away from the table because we have to assume the seats are occupied. Like if this person sitting on a table on, and the other person sitting on a table, I still have to have 36 inches. Otherwise, a person with a wheelchair cannot pass. This only applies to the path of travel within the restaurant from the front door to the cashier counter, to the ADA table, to the self-service counter, to the bathroom. So it does not apply everywhere in the restaurant. So I'm going to show you some solution. We managed to dismiss some of these lawsuits by providing tables similar to this. These are the only measure the 30 inches from the most protruding item, which is the base of the legs. See here? It's the base of the legs where we measure 30 inches. And this table was qualified. So this table, it's another part of a, of a, of a lawsuit we managed to dismiss because uh, we limited it to, to the lawsuit itself, and the judge agreed with us. Um, so please take look at your tables if you have a restaurant. And the tables need to be distributed by seating areas. If you have outside seating area, you need to have 5% of your seats translated into tables. If you have 20 seats, you have to have one ADA table. If you have 25 seats, you have to have two ADA tables. Similar to the inside, and similar if you have different um, enjoyment of services, and if you have a, a counter as well, you need to have a uh, part of the counter be lowered for people to enjoy using it. Also, if you have a booth seating, a booth seating, it's easily fixed like this. You could remove the booth from one side and just have shares in here, and this will become ADA table. Remember, ADA tables needs to have the simple of accessibility on them. If you are, uh, if they are self seating. If you see them, if you have a hostess and see them, you don't have to have that simple of accessibility. Um, so uh, there are always solutions. And there was all, always creative solutions. Here is um, another very common barrier. Nothing could protrude, oops, sorry. Nothing can protrude more than four inches maximum 
between the heights of 27 and 80. So anything hanging can't hang under 80 inches. Remember, we talked about that with the parking, but that applies to the interior as well. Apparently, there are, uh, I'm six foot four tall, but there are blind people who are taller than me and they could hit their head. But if something is protruding more than four inches, the keen cannot detect it. So in this case here, a blind person or semi-blind person walking could his, hit his, his, his side on a protruding item. The solution is easy. You just put a post in this area under the, the counter in this case, and the cane will hit it, as long as that post is no more than four inches from each edge. Now, I, I mentioned before uh, um, the counter. Um, if you look down here, this is the food counter. A food counter has to have the 19 inches depth. But if you have a cashier counter that is high and it was built before 1992, you could install a flip-up counter. This is a, a residential example, but just I like it as an example. And the counter will flip up and be used whenever a person with disabilities could come and, and uh, to, you, to your store. So there's a difference between a food counter and a cashier counter. Cashier counter does not need a knee space under it because people could approach it. Um, uh, people could approach it from the side. Food counter, yes, because they have to eat forward against the, the thing. Food counter, 60 inches wide and similar to the table height and, and clear spaces. Cashier counter is 36 inch wide. So those are small differences uh, be between them. Um, I want to talk to you about bathrooms. In this brand new bathroom, there are a lot of issues. Let's start by the garbage can being placed next to the transfer. See, this is what the transfer space of the bathroom. A person should be able to transfer to the toilet by parking his wheelchair next to it. Placing the, the, the uh, garbage can here prevents that. Easy solution. This is very common. It's the seat cover dispenser. Almost everywhere we see the seat cover dispensers behind the toilet seat. It's not reachable because it's blocked. It just needs to be moved to an open wall and the height of the paper is maximum 40 inches. Other common mistakes is the location of the activator for the toilet. It can't be across from the toilet. People cannot cross over a soil toilet to flush. It has to be on the right side, on the open side. This, when you buy a toilet, you always have to specify if you want the act actuator to be on the right, on the left side. So be, be very careful around this. The location of the grab bars, this low black this back grab bar should be 12 inches and 24 inches center to the toilet, and usually no more than six inches from the edge. The other thing is, this is the location of the center line of the toilet. Now, federal law says 16 to 18. California says 18 exactly, but then California changed it recently to say 17 to 18 to give you um, uh, um, a leeway. Now, what happens here, when we have one exact dimension, we could have a construction tolerance of quarter of an inch or less. But when we have a range like 16 to 18 or 17 to 18, we have to be between that range and even one eighth of an inch over 18 becomes a barrier. Now, doing the plumbing works usually is expensive. It's really expensive. And usually people are off by half an inch. So installing an offset flange under the toilet, it's, I don't know, it's maybe $35, gives you up to three quarters of an inch in each direction. There are actually toilets that give you three inches, uh, but they're hard to find and they're extremely expensive. Uh, because the bottom of the toilet is, is what's, uh, uh, what's used here. So uh, these are, there are, as I said, 68 items that could go wrong on a bathroom. 
and those are parts part of this. The best garbage can you could use is the one embedded in a wall. Um, so I want to um, talk to you uh, about sinks. Uh, another example, sinks, center line of the sinks from the wall can be over 80 inches. Sinks height is important. Sinks knee space is important, similar to the tables. Uh, but the sinks plumbing, the hut line and the drain line have has to be covered because if the hot water is running and a person brings in with his knee, he's not going to feel the hot water. He's going to get second degrees burns and, and just because that edge was not. The cover is really easy to buy, easy to purchase, and, and available, I think, through Amazon. Um, those are a very common mistakes that, uh, that are happening here. And uh, and I am open for all your questions. If you have any questions, if not, uh, hopefully you get some information that is very helpful. And I know the EDC has a copy of this presentation as a PDF. They could share it with you guys with the pictures and everything. And, uh, um, and also, if you have a quick question, uh, feel free to send me an email. Emails are the easiest part. Um, obviously, it will be a general questions because we cannot give answers uh, based on uh, hypothetical. So um, said that, uh, if there's any question and answers, please feel, feel, feel free to, to ask them. Thank you, Bassam. That was really great information. I do have a question and it's who is subject to ADA requirements? Any, any business that is open for public accommodation. A retail store is, is subject to ADA compliance. Um, offices are subject to ADA compliance. So uh, if you're a business, if you own, lease, operate, as we said in slide number two, then you are subject to the ADA compliance. Um, there is another compliance, compliance related to employees and employers, uh, uh, but uh, uh, for new businesses, uh, it's, it comes automatically for older businesses. It depends on, uh, on a request. Like if you have an employee who suddenly became disabled, you can't fire them, and they will request from you to provide them with, for example, uh, a grab bar in the bathroom. You go and provide them with the grab bars in the bathroom. Um, some residential are, uh, are uh, under the Fair Housing Act, and if they have a, a, a leasing office, the leasing office area is a public accommodation. Uh, apartment buildings have been sued. There's, there's multiple lawsuits right now. Um, but the Fair Housing Act, uh, it's, it's, uh, if your building has built, was built before 1992, it does not apply. You don't have to change anything. It does not apply under, under residential. So again, if any people who don't work in your business come to your business, you are uh, a public accommodation. Thank you. And then the next question is, how does someone, um, how, who do they call or how do, can they get or conduct a CAS uh, survey uh, on their property? Well, you can, uh, uh, you can call me, but you, there is a list. If you go to the, to the uh, uh, Department of State Architects and, and there's a list uh, there with all uh, CAS people, um, uh, you just you, you just type in Google cast list and uh, you'll have their phone numbers and there will be a note next to them where they're operating and uh, and you could call them and see if they are uh, some some of them are not operating they just got the certification because of their jobs and uh, but if you are gonna hire a cast there's a few things you need to ask them it's not just about the money uh, you need to ask them if they are if they will issue you the certificates. Some CASP experts are are not issuing certificates because they don't want to have the legal the legal obligation. Second, you need to ask about their experience and have they been to court 
as expert witnesses. This is very important because if you are sued, the case could get complicated at any time. So if you are sued, you need somebody who the court recognizes as an expert and not every, every CASP uh, certificate is, is recognized by the court. The other thing you need to find out uh, uh, referrers um, and uh, find out their background. There are a lot of, um, there are few, not a lot, but few CASP uh, people that are actually contractors and retired and went through the examination and somehow passed it. The passing rate is 25%, so it's not an easy exam. And, uh, and uh, they might uh, exaggerate the solutions because they're contractors at the same time. The final thing I could advise you is, uh, is uh, to make sure that your cast person is not the same contractor or even he's not the architect who's gonna do you the design. Because uh, you, don't, you don't want somebody to suggest a solution that's gonna cost you $30,000 because they're gonna benefit from, from it differently. Um, I personally do not, I stopped doing designs long time ago. I only do uh, accessibility consultation. I do peer review of architects drawings and I check on the contractors after they, uh, after they constructed. One example, a person obtained a CASP report in San Francisco, and the person who gave him the cash report, uh, an architect suggested uh, around thirty-five thousand dollars worth of, of fixing, and uh, that thirty-five thousand dollars includes uh, the design for the for the new fixing. The building was pre nineteen ninety two and never touched. So the lawyer, who knows me, hired me to uh, go double check on it, and the solution was an automatic door opener. At that time, was eighteen hundred dollars was an accept acceptable solution instead of changing whole sidewalks and doors and stuff like that. So experience and, and uh, it's very important. Um, it saves you at the end. Okay, thank you. It doesn't look like we have any further questions. So I want to thank our presenter for sharing such great information and resources today. And thank you to all of you who joined us today um, again, there will be a recording of this if you want to go back to any of the slides that Bassam uh, presented today, um, you can definitely um, take a look on our website. Um, it will also be available on his website and his contact information is, as you can see, is here. If you do need to, um, you know, for whatever reason, you, you misplace it and you need to get uh, in contact with us um, to uh, connect with Bassam, please feel free to give us a call or email us and we can happily send you his information um, if you have further questions that you prefer to um, ask outside of this um, presentation. Um, and so again, yeah, if you want to follow with our presenter, his information is here on the slide. Uh, so please feel free to reach out to him directly. Uh, please join us and register for upcoming San Pablo EDC webinars. Um, you can visit our website and you will see a calendar of list of future webinars that you can register for. Again, thank you, Bassam, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, we really appreciate all of your expertise and uh, I hope that everyone learned a lot today. And if there is, again, any uh, questions, please feel free to reach out to him directly or to us. Um, so again, thank you and hope, uh, I hope that everyone has a wonderful day today. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.